Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, proceedings, both here in person at the uh, Royal Society of Victoria's Ellery Theatre, uh, but also to those people via Zoom uh, and online live streamed on YouTube. Uh, welcome to you as well. My name's Rob Gell. I'm the uh, president of the Royal Society of Victoria. Before we begin, and in a spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that all of us are located on the traditional lands of this state's first scientists, the many different First Nations peoples who belong to the diverse and lands of waters of what we now call Victoria. We're coming to you from the lands of the, of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people and invite uh, everyone uh, joining us tonight, either via the Zoom's webinar chat function or via YouTube's comments section uh, to those following on the live stream to acknowledge the traditional custodians of your own uh, local country and join me in paying respects to elders past and present and likewise extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us at this meeting tonight. Um, tonight we're delighted to be joined by Dr Cassandra Steer uh, for her presentation, Space to the Rescue. I can't wait. Australia's national dependency on space technologies. I've not met Cassandra before, apart from when she got out of the Uber, and we both walked in together about uh, 10, 15 minutes ago. So I'm looking forward to what she's going to talk about. Uh, the question as to whether our federal government will invest in the space sector has been hotly debated over the last few years. In 2023, the budget for the Australian Space Agency was significantly reduced. The planned National Space Mission for Earth observation was cancelled and investment in several launch sites across the country was cut. At the same time, it was unclear as to whether space technologies would fall under AUKUS plans or under the National Reconstruction Fund. Uh, Mike Flatley and I, uh, Mike, our CEO, and I went to the Australian Academy of Science annual conference last December, and the discussion about uh, AUKUS and scientific research was the topic uh, for the day, and it's all very interesting how that's all going to precipitate out. Why does any of this matter? Well, uh, why should we be concerned about investing in space technologies at all when there's uh, so many pressing, pressing issues here on Earth and indeed just in Australia? This is what Cassandra's going to help us out with. Uh, she's going to come to grips with some of those issues tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about her first. Uh, Dr Steer is Deputy Director, Mission Specialist at the Australian National University Institute for Space, known as InSpace. Uh, she's also chair and founder of the Australian Centre for Space Governance. She's globally recognised for her expertise in space governance, space law and space security. And she's published widely on these topics, including the application of the law of armed conflict and the use of force in outer space. She's consulted to the Australian, Canadian and US Departments of Defence, the Australian Space Agency and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade on all of these issues. She's taught space law and space security at Gill University, the AN College of Law, the National Security College and the Australian Defence College. Dr Steer is multilingual. She has lived and worked in five countries in a range of educational, non-profit and public institutions. Cassandra has degrees in philosophy, civil law, international law, international criminal law and training in common law, comparative law and space law. That does my head in a bit, but never mind. She's a member of the Australian Space Agency's Technical Advisor Group for Space Situational Awareness, a member of the Space Traffic Management Committee of the International Ac uh, Academy of Astronautics, and a member of the International Institute of Space Law. Please welcome Cassandra. Come and I've got a couple of questions before you begin. How did you get into space? What happened? What happened? As a lawyer. Precisely. Law first? Law first. Uh, and I never thought about space. So my father was a huge sci-fi fan, but it never interested in me. Um, uh, so law first, international law. I was really looking at war and war crimes and international relations and kind of how do we deal with the worst things humans do to each other. And then after a while, the more I spoke to military lawyers, they started to tell me cyber, obviously, is where yep. things are going, but what else is changing warfare is space. Um, and then I realised that the technologies in space and what's going on there is just kind of the next set of questions for the same issues I've been working on, and it's become a passion of mine for the last decade or so. All right. I'm, I'm going to let you, because I'm, I don't... <laughs> 
I'm not familiar with this, so I don't have any other intelligent questions to ask. <laughs> but I might have one when you're done. Yeah, great. So over to you, and we'll have some time uh, for questions and questions from the audience uh, when you're concluded. Excellent. Thanks for being with us. Um, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I grew up uh, on Ngunnawal country in Canberra, but I currently live in Canada, um, but still work for these two Australian institutes. So it is one of the... the in fact, perhaps the only good thing that came out of the pandemic uh, is that remote work is a possibility and I continue to be very active in what's going on in Australia. Uh, and it was based on, I think, some LinkedIn comments that I had about what was going on, particularly with the National Space Mission for Earth Observation, that Mike Flatley reached, flatly reached out and said, do you want to write a, a letter in our publication, um, a letter to the editor, and would you like to come and speak for the Royal Society of Victoria? So I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, and honoured that you might want a humanities person to come and speak for the Royal Society of Victoria. I am not a scientist. I was like, hey, at chemistry, I was terrible at maths. So I gave all of that up uh, when I could <laughs> um, and moved into the humanities and into law. But what I love about my job is that I'm dealing constantly with uh, new technologies and I work very closely at the ANU with um, the, the nations and in some cases the world's experts in very cutting edge uh, space technologies, quantum computing, robotics and AI, um, uh, sensors on earth observation, instrumentation, people doing space health and space medicine, um, uh, earth sciences, geodetic, I don't even know what geodetic means, but one of my colleagues does geodetic stuff with this earth observation data. And so I'm constantly learning about these technologies, but I just want to qualify, I'm not a scientist, so I can't answer any questions about those technologies. Um, but what I can do is walk you through why I've called this presentation Space to the Rescue. It's a little bit tongue in cheek because part of the messaging that I focus on, particularly through the Australian Centre for Space Governance, is to try and, I guess, undo a little bit the focus. Uh, in fact, let me ask you the question. If I say space, what is it that you think about? What comes to mind if I'm saying space to the rescue? Satellites. Satellites? Okay, see, this is what happens when you speak to scientists. Yes, what else? <laughs> rockets. rockets. Usually the first answer is rockets and astronauts. And of course that's all super exciting, particularly with the forthcoming return to the moon. In the next couple of years, the Artemis mission that NASA is leading and that Australia has some really important robotics and communications contributions to. It's really exciting. And in the next five years, they're gonna put the first woman on the moon, the first person of color on the moon, um, and the idea is that Russia and China and India, Japan, you know, there's, there is a return to the moon. So it is very exciting, but it is a very small portion of what's going on. And usually the first answer is not satellites. So it speaks to uh, how informed you are. I want to say something very briefly about um, the two institutions that I'm affiliated with, so ANU Institute for Space. Um, it's an innovation institute, that means it doesn't belong to any of the colleges or faculties at the ANU, it sits right under ANU Central, uh, to really bring together researchers and expertise from across the whole campus. So we have what do we call our mission specialists, bit of a fancy title for people who are working in a range of areas, as I mentioned, um, space biology, space health and medicine, space law, space governance, economics, as well as the, the kind of more direct applications you might think of, like working on building satellites and sensors and that kind of thing. ANU in space is really the front door to all things space uh, at the university, so we work to bring those researchers um, to translate what they're doing into commercial opportunities, pair them with industry, pair them with government, serve government needs as well. Um, and we have over $200 million of infrastructure, much of which in space has helped bring in the money for. So we're very proud of what we achieve. Um, and I guess something that I didn't quite understand about ANU before coming to join it in 2020 was that it's part of the Commonwealth government. So it's different from other university institutes in that sense. It really is there to serve and uplift government in that sense. The Australian Centre for Space Governance is an initiative that InSpace helped to set up. It supported me to set it up. Um, but it is, uh, it's made up of experts, humanities space experts from across six different universities, including RMIT here in Victoria. Um, and our mission is to impact national agenda setting for Australia's space activities uh, and advance Australia's interests in space in the 21st century. And by that, I don't necessarily mean rockets and astronauts. So we have, again, Australia's and in some cases, the world's leading experts in 
really cool things like space archaeology, space law, space governance, space security, space policy. We have social scientists and political scientists. Um, we have someone who specialises in property here at RMIT who's very interested in helping the property industry think about future property interest in space, space hotels and weird things like that, but also intellectual property interests and also how the property sector here, in particular in Australia, depends on Earth observation data for things like reinsurance assessment in the face of floods, urban planning, those kinds of things. And we work very closely into government. We, we really do a lot of stuff together with Geoscience Australia, CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology, and of course the Space Agency and Defence Space Command. Uh, the disclaimer is simply to say, I'm a very opinionated person, uh, and I'm unafraid to say my opinions, and they are my personal opinions, uh, not necessarily those of the institutions I work with and for. So, again, this is probably a more informed audience that I'm used to speaking to, and that includes highly intelligent people in a range of fields, um, but the fact that the first answer to my question was satellites is not usually um, the first answer that I get. So I always start with why space matters, particularly if we have so many issues on Earth um, to deal with, so many issues in Australia, most people will say, I'd rather fix the housing crisis or deal with bushfires than invest in space. To which my answer is, but did you know how many times today you've used space? Your telecommunications are dependent on satellites. Your TV broadcasting has been dependent on satellites for decades, since the 1970s and 1980s. Your internet is dependent on satellites more and more, so NBN in Australia, but of course I'm sure that all of you have heard of SpaceX Starlink, which is uh, a low Earth orbit, um, a constellation of many, many, many quite small satellites, sort of half the size of the lectern before me. Um, in fact, we're up to several thousand, I think about uh, six or eight thousand by now, but Elon Musk's company has filed for and received approval for 40,000 satellites. Now, I'm not going to talk much about space debris and space orbits in my presentation, but I'm more than happy to speak to that in questions because it is an issue that, um, you know, the amount of space traffic and space debris up there threatens the capabilities that we depend on for our daily lives. Uh, I used an Uber to get here and he used GPS to get me here. So uh, I also ordered Uber Eats today for lunch. Um, don't mean to be advertising for Uber right now, but GPS, uh, GPS is something we all depend on. It was a US military invention uh, in the 1980s and it's something that we all use for free. Um, there are uh, similar uh, systems around the world. Europe, Europe has what's called Galileo, the Chinese have a system called Baidu, and the Russians have a system called GLONASS, so different regional positioning satellite systems. Um, civil aviation, I flew from Canada just a couple of weeks ago and I flew down from Canberra this morning, and those pilots depend on GPS. In fact, it's turning out to be a little bit problematic just how much pilots depend on GPS. I was speaking to a Canadian pilot a couple of weeks ago who said, um, and he flies very small planes, normally they would depend upon uh, radio beacons to help them navigate to exactly where the, um, the landing strip is, and they use GPS as well. But the government is taking out these apparently outdated radio beacons and simply putting in more GPS receivers. GPS is extremely easy to jam. A truck driver has known to uh, jam GPS because he didn't, know where he didn't want his employer to know where he was when he was taking a break to see his girlfriend at lunch. So he jammed the GPS of his own truck while driving past an airport and accidentally jammed the entire system that the pilots were depending upon. Um, it's very easy to jam. It's, it also means if there is a deliberate nefarious intervention in the GPS system because, for example, Russia might want to be interfering with the US's dependency on its own system, we would suffer. And if there are no radio beacons as a redundancy, we have an enormous issue. So the dependency on space capabilities without backup is a problem. Apparently in the Navy today, they are teaching um, uh, trainees how to use an, a sextant and having to teach army cadets how to read maps because who knows how to read maps these days. So the same goes for global shipping, and it supports glo a global economy in terms of trade and shipping. Remote health and real-time health data, and we learned in the pandemic how important that was, in particular for remote communities. Every time you buy a coffee by waving your watch or your phone or your card over something, that is dependent on what's called position, excuse me, position navigation and timing satellites, or PNT. 
of which GPS is one example. But it's the timing aspect which is so critical both for those kinds of payments and for the global financial system. The stock market is down to millisecond movements of enormous amounts of money if that PNT system has uh, um, a loss of service even temporarily, it can cause enormous um, issues and damage. Weather, when you're deciding what to wear by checking the weather, this is clearly from Canada and not from Australia, um, you are using weather prediction satellites, um, which probably that data is coming from the Bureau of Meteorology, one of the biggest users and providers of that data in Australia. 50% of our climate data comes from satellites globally. And some of that data can come from nowhere but satellites. So our ability to deal with climate change depends on Earth observation satellites. The same goes, of course, for bushfires, uh, and particularly the ability to track in real time and provide information to firefighters, but also the ability to predict uh, and therefore mitigate ahead of time. And there's a particular um, technology coming out of the ANU, which um, we had thought was going to be part of the National Space Mission for Earth Observation, which I will get to shortly. Um, we're now seeking other avenues for that because we've had researchers who've developed a, a sensor that would go on an Earth observation satellite that is specifically tailored to eucalypt forests, eucalypt vegetation. Most of the Earth observation satellites around the world, because they come from Japan or Europe or the US, are not tailored to our vegetation. And so this sensor is an Australian capability to help Australian needs, but would also serve countries in the region which have similar vegetation to us. Uh, farming and agriculture, that is how farmers and the agri-tech sector today is able to do precision sowing, crop management, irrigation, fertilisation. That helps them become economically competitive, but it's also critical for their ability to have climate uh, resistant crops and, and to deal with food security. Without that data, they are back to the 1990s as what happened last year. There was a brief outage uh, of a um, European-owned satellite that the agri-tech sector in Australia and New Zealand depends on. It only lasted, I think, half a day or a day. Um, but there were farmers saying, we're stuck back in the 1990s, which is not that far long ago. And you would think, well, you should know how to operate farm equipment without that. But the problem is the, in the infrastructure now is not set up to do what it used to do. It's set up to be dependent on this technology. They also don't have as many uh, farm staff on hand as they would have had in the 1990s to drive that equipment because a lot of it is automated today. So it is actually problematic. Search and rescue dependent on PNT uh, for locating where someone might be, dependent on satellite communications quite often, sometimes dependent on Earth observation as well. Um, this is an image from a commercial Earth observation company. Um, I should be able to see which one and I can't, so I've failed to credit that image properly, but it's an image from Indonesia on the left, 2018, on the right, deforestation just one year later. So where it is brown, um, that is deforestation. Earth observation is providing us with much more accurate, um, usable information about what's happening on the ground. Of course, being able to track for maritime domain awareness. So for both for national security purposes, which is incredibly important in the South China Sea and our immediate region as well, but also for assisting uh, fisheries and for some of our um, island nations in the neighborhood, that's incredibly important for their um, sovereignty and their economy, protecting against illegal fishing, for example, and protecting their uh, economic zones. Um, this is an image from um, uh, European Space Agency. Those blue dots, so this is using different kinds of Earth observation imagery that, and data which is then overlaid into a map. This is tracking plastic pollution through ocean currents across the globe. Uh, and then all of those applications that I've just mentioned have military applications. Some of them were developed through the military. Modern militaries today cannot operate without space-based capabilities. Um, and the most technologically advanced are the most vulnerable because their dependencies are so great, they don't have enormous uh, redundancies, as I mentioned about a pilot saying, well, if I lose GPS, I've got no backup. Um, and uh, space has become very strategic in its own right as a domain. It's become highly contested. Again, I'm not going to go into that now, but more than happy to chat about that in the questions. Um, because of those capabilities being so critical, the most effective way to take out the eyes or ears of your adversary are to compromise their space capabilities, even temporarily jam a radio signal so that they can't communicate, or even just listen in so that their cryptic communications, their classified communications, have now become useless because you, because you can hear them. Um, spoof a GPS signal, give a false signal. In other words, you don't know if you're here or there or if your adversary is here or there. 
uh, or temporarily or even sometimes permanently dazzle or blind an Earth observation satellite that's being used for intelligence so it can't gather the information it's trying to get. Um, the problem is, today space has become so commercialized, the vast majority of satellites and capabilities are dual use. In other words, mostly commercial companies that are providing one service both to military clients and to you and I, or to our civil government uh, as clients. And so we are impacted when those services are targeted or interfered with. So space matters, it matters every single day. I keep being told, just talk to people about their Fitbits or if they play golf, they're using GPS. I mean, whatever level that you need, space is, is it permeating our lives. Um, and to drill down a bit more, I guess, into Australia-specific interests and dependencies, we have a huge commitment right now to closing the gap, and that includes closing the dig digital divide. Um, and, and not only for Indigenous Australians, but really remote and rural uh, and regional Australians, uh, generally regardless of their ethnicity or background, we need to be closing the digital divide. That's because education also depends on te uh, internet telecommunications, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me. Indigenous engagement is obviously top of mind for a range of issues. And there are actually some good news stories, which I promised in the little blurb that I sent to Mike. It's not all scary stuff. There's some really good news stories that I think we should, we being the government, we being those who work in the space sector, uh, make more effort to be telling these kinds of stories. So um, this is an image of um, Equatorial Launch, Australia's launch site up in East Arnhem Land in Northern Territory. You may have read about it in the news last year. They launched on behalf of NASA. Some small sounding rockets that are ever so slightly taller than I am, so very small rockets. They didn't go into orbit, they went into uh, the upper atmosphere to do atmospheric testing for environmental data. But it was very exciting for an Australian launch site to be the client of NASA, and that really set a precedent for what we think is possible in the future. Um, it's advantageous that they're right up close to the equator for various reasons and the physics of getting up into space, so for actual orbital launch. What really is so impressive about Equatorial Launch from its inception was they brought in a woman named Carly Scott as their first CEO who had worked for the Northern Land Council, she'd worked for Northern Development, she had long-standing relationships with the Indigenous communities there, and she sought and successfully um, set up co-governance with the Yolnu mob, the, the traditional owners up in Ipa, East Arnhem Land. So they were setting up um, governance principles and making sure there were actual training uh, mechanisms in place for uh, careers for the Indigenous mob, actual financial benefits to their community. The Indigenous rangers are the ones who manage cultural heritage in the region, so when those NASA rockets launched, you can predict the, their return, where they're going to land again. It was the Indigenous rangers who had the sole right to go out onto country and recover those objects and bring them back to ensure that cultural heritage could be protected. So amazing engagement. Um, I would say, and here you go with my personal opinions, um, the current CEO has made explicit statements that he just doesn't think it's as important to be engaging with those Indigenous communities because he has a business that he needs to grow. And they're looking to expand that site, which is, you know, that may be a good thing or a bad thing, but there needs to be proper, uh, not just environmental impact assessments, but proper assessments about um, cultural impact. And is it, are we still doing this based on co-governance? Where are the financial benefits? Uh, unfortunately, we don't seem to have the same kind of commitment from the current CEO. But the good news story is a precedent was set for how the sector can engage properly, genuinely engage with Indigenous communities. The other one is, this is a satellite dish owned by an Indigenous business called the Centre for Appropriate Technology, South Australian business, and this is in Alice Springs. Um, this satellite dish uh, does the, the downlink for Earth observation data, so it's downloading the data, and Geoscience Australia and CSIRO worked very closely with that business and they, they, um, they buy the service from the satellite dish owners, from the Centre for Appropriate Technology. And they've also worked hard to build in um, two-way knowledge exchange um, and bringing in, excuse me, indigenous, uh, indigenous communities, bringing in opportunities to really look at how this can be expanded. Geoscience Australia and CSIRO also have very close relationships with indigenous communities uh, in Queensland and Northern Territory where there are ground sensors that are used to calibrate uh, um, earth observation sensors. So again, this is the humanity speak person speaking, but um, in order to ensure that the sensors remain precise in what they are sensing, most of them will calibrate to the moon because that is a standard all of them can calibrate to, but they will also use ground sensors. And for that, you need what we have, which is really great geography, open skies, um, 
not a lot of cloud cover in, in those particular regions of Australia. Um, very easy to have um, to be able to rely on those ground sensors, and that is quite often on Indigenous country. So again, CSIRO and GA have worked with those Indigenous rangers to train them up. They manage that infrastructure, and then they also benefit from that data, Earth observation data, to augment their traditional management of land and waters. So there's some really great stories to be telling as well. Um, so. Climate change and floods and bushfires, obviously, Earth observation data is critical for that. Um, when the uh, volcano exploded um, right near Tonga at the beginning of last year or end of the year before, my timelines are stretched, um, it destroyed the undersea cable network for communications for Tonga and neighbouring islands. So volcanologists did not predict this particular eruption. They certainly didn't predict the size of it. And they've been using Earth observation data to understand what went on and to help them predict future eruptions. Um, but on top of that, because Tonga and the, the islands in the region lost, completely lost their undersea um, uh, networks and for connectivity, uh, it turns out the University of South Pacific, which has main campuses on <coughs> Tonga and Fiji, um, they have satellite dishes on all of these islands and they have access to an Inmarsat satellite and they've been doing this for years so that they can have online and remote education for across 12 different islands, many, many years. Suddenly this was a critical piece of infrastructure. So there were families lining up on the campus of the University of South Pacific in Tonga to try and get access to this internet and telecommunications connectivity so they could communicate with family, make sure everyone was okay. The government then came to the university and said, well, this is, this is now critical national infrastructure. Can we leverage it? And the university happened to have been working on a second satellite dish, with that, which they were able to deploy very quickly with the government's help. So Tonga is ahead of Australia in that sense. Earth observation data, communications as well, but particularly EO data can really uh, aid in strengthening democracy. So it's used in some countries where elections are happening in extremely politically unstable situations. It's also used, I've learned very recently in Australia in terms of helping out where to, it's kind of gerrymandering like goes on in the US to figure out electoral boundaries to the benefit of certain parties. But this goes to sovereignty as well, and that was kind of my point with Tonga. We, we kind of hear this need for sovereign capabilities. It's got to be sovereign owned. I, I, I want to speak a little bit more to what that means because it doesn't have to mean end to end everything was built here and the chips and everything like that. What it means is we need to have access to, guaranteed access to how those capabilities are tasked and how, we, how and when we can access the data. Um, so it really contributes, and, and that is what Tonga has done, uh, quite frankly. Um, that is what Japan and South Korea have done, Japan in particular. So the more of these kinds of capabilities are sovereign or are shared capabilities across friendly nations, the more we contribute to balancing the region, because guess what? We all need connectivity. We all need um, Earth observation data, as it turns out. We all need position navigation and timing. So you probably all are quite aware of the debates around Huawei and what do we do about 5G, because if it's all Chinese infrastructure, what happens then about uh, dependencies uh, and foreign interference? Well, the same goes for all of these satellite-based capabilities. So the more we're able to do this together in the region, the more we shore up the region, the more we make it more politically stable, which feeds into our national interests. Um, and it's very much in line with the current government's commitment to continue to repair relationships in the region and continue to enter into relationships with, uh, so this is, um, uh, I almost said Prime Minister, Minister Wong, <laughs> with the Prime Minister of Samoa. Uh, and I love this image because they're looking each other eye to eye, which is really what these relationships are about right now. Um, and space capability, space technology cooperation is a way to augment that. Um, for our benefit as well, sometimes we need others to help us out. We're not always the leaders in this. There really is very much a mutual benefit to that. Um, so I really see it as an um, Asia-Pacific diplomacy lever is to be um, thinking about space technology cooperation a little bit more um, carefully than we have been, perhaps. And the Quad is another obvious example. So um, Japan is a lead player geopolitically in the region, but they are a lead space player. Um, Japan has very sophisticated Earth observation uh, data, which we depend on. Their communications are pretty sophisticated. Their space science is outstanding. So you may have heard of the Hayabusa mission a couple of years ago, where they sent a spacecraft to an asteroid. They uh, extracted a sample and were able to return it to Earth, the world's first. The Australian Space Agency supported them on that because they 
they returned in Australia. Uh, and so we already have a strong space cooperation relationship with Japan. We depend on Japan's Earth observation data. We get all of our AO data from Japan, the European Space Agency, and the US. Um, at the same time, uh, obviously, uh, Japan and the US are very strong allies, and Japan has been very strategic about its space alliance with the US. It sees that as a very important part of its um, bilateral relationship and what it can do in terms of diplomacy, what can, in terms of its re strengthening its relationship with the US, what can Japan offer to the US that the US either doesn't already do or perhaps wants to do le less of so that there is a mutual dependency to a certain extent. Um, and also, there's a lot going on which I said I wasn't going to talk about in terms of space arms control and what's called responsible behaviours in space to kind of reduce the risk of a conflict in space, which would impact all of us because of our dependencies. Um, Japan, the US and Australia have been very key in pushing that agenda through the UN, and India, perhaps unsurprisingly, has remained a little bit ambivalent because uh, there is a um, sort of West versus China and Russia on the other side debate going on in terms of how to resolve those, uh, those issues and that agenda. It's become highly politicized. And India has decided not to take a side. It's carving out its own uh, position as a rising superpower. There is a potential for the other three in the Quad to push that a little bit, to get India to get on to the responsible behaviors side of things. Uh, and there's a potential for us to be using space technology cooperation for everything that the Quad is set up to try and do um, regionally. Uh, the Asia-Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, so space agencies as in national space agencies, Australian Space Agency, New Zealand Space Agency, this was established by the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, um, as a regional, again, they think about space technology cooperation as part of their um, diplomatic and geopolitical strategy. <laughs> Um, they see the benefits in it, they are leaders in it, and they did this partly because China has set up a, a similar regional organisation of which Japan, Australia and New Zealand are not a member, but Chinese um, friendly or smaller nations that China wants to exercise that diplomatic lever with uh, are part of that uh, organisation and we are part of um, APRASAF. It's hosted in a different country every year. In Perth, in November of this year, it's hosted in Australia. So there's an enormous opportunity that is, that is driven by JAXA, but the host country space agency um, does a lot of programmatic and organizational side of things. Um, we're hosting a lot of um, countries, space agencies here. There's an enormous opportunity to think about this as also a, a, um, a DFAT opportunity. Obviously, defense will be there as well, but a home affairs opportunity. Like, how are we thinking about the opportunity of bringing these space agencies together and space technology cooperation as a diplomatic opportunity? So, uh, what we do have in Australia is a civil Australian space agency and a defence space command. Um, there was a debate already in the 1980s, which some of you probably are very familiar with, as to whether or not we should have a space division or a space agency. That debate continued on into the 1990s. Um, one of the people who's part of the Australian Centre for Space Governance, Tristan Moss, is a space historian, and he gives a fantastic overview uh, in various presentations and publications about what, what kind of happened with these political decisions continually not to do space. It wasn't an accident. There were, there were very much um, political decisions, most of it to do with our relationship with the US at any given moment. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, we actually launched a satellite from Woomera in the late 1950s. We were the third country in the world to have a sovereign satellite launched into space. It was on a British rocket, but it was from Woomera, and it was a university-designed Australian satellite. And people kind of say, we gave up after that. Well, Geoscience Australia and um, CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology will say, they'll tell you, actually, we didn't give up on it. We've been quietly going on doing all this really important ground-based infrastructure and data management. GA manages all of the data from the European Space Agency's Copernicus program, the Earth Observation program. Manage all of it, which is a complex thing, and then we feed it back out to other users. Um, and those agencies are providing data across the government for many, many purposes very often. So we do space, we just don't necessarily do space. We do the ground infrastructure of space and the link and the data part of space, which most people don't think about as being part of space infrastructure, but it's actually a very critical aspect to it. Um, so we did introduce uh, the Space Activities Act in 1998. Um, focus very much on launch only, so not all these other space activities. Uh, that was updated in 2018 to the Launch and Returns Act, which is the current legislation applicable to any Australian company that wants to have a satellite launched elsewhere 
but because it falls under Australia's responsibility, you still need Australian licensing. Uh, any launch company like Gilmore Space up in Queensland that wants to launch its own rockets, any launch site like Equatorial Launch, in, uh, Equatorial Launch Australia in the Northern Territory or Southern Space in South Australia, which are providing a spaceport. They don't have their own rockets, they're providing a place that others can bring their rockets and launch them. All of those kinds of entities need a licence under this uh, particular act. And then in 2018, we also got our own space agency. The Australian Centre for Space Governance recently uh, led Australia's most comprehensive public opinion poll about what do Australian residents know about Australia's uh, space activities in the past, about our current spending, what do they know about Earth observational communications and their applications and our dependencies? What do you think we should be spending money on? Um, and in fact, I see Alex DJ here, who was one of the authors of that report. Um, and we learned that 20%, and it was very representative, 1,500 people uh, were surveyed through a panel to make sure it's representative in terms of gender, ethnicity, age, political preference, regional versus city, quite a representative panel. 20% of Australians did not know we have an Australian space agency. Nonetheless, they exist, they've been doing great stuff. We have a civil space strategy, which was, um, I want to say launched, was, uh, was established in 2019. Um, and that sets out seven critical priority areas that it will um, fund and develop. The Australian Space Agency was given a bit of a bum steer, I think, personal opinion. Um, the, established under the previous government, whose top three priorities were jobs and growth, jobs and growth and jobs and growth, um, which is fine, but if that's the only priority in setting up a government agency, it was a little bit distracting. So its mandate was create a space, and is, create a space industry and regulate that space industry. It's already a bit of a difficult thing to do both at once. The, um, I mentioned before how commercialised the space sector is globally. Um, of the currently about 11,500 operational satellites in orbit, well over two-thirds belong to commercial entities and more than half belong to one single commercial entity, being SpaceX. Um, but aside from SpaceX, the, the commercialised nature of space, space industry is very interested in what it can do that governments can't do and governments are interested in buying those products and those services from space industry. So the space industry globally was super excited when Australia got an, a, an agency whose mandate was to grow an industry. However, it wasn't given the mandate grow an industry to serve Australia's national needs and priorities. It was just told grow an industry. So they have seven capability areas, things like uh, access to space, or in other words, launch, uh, robotics, earth observation, communications, space situational awareness, which is looking up to track all of these objects in space, all the space traffic. All seven of those areas are important and interesting areas. But why seven? Why not five or three? Why those seven and not different ones? There wasn't any explicit strategic thinking or messaging about that. And so then the agency was given a fairly significant budget to go and hand out seed funding in these seven areas. So quite dispersed, became very competitive very quickly. Small startups and research and bigger companies all trying to elbow each other out for seed funding to have this industry grow. But none of it based on what does Australia need? What do we depend on? What do we really need to grow ourselves versus what we can buy from others or partner with others for? So a civil space strategy, though perhaps not so strategic. Defence Space Command was stood up. So I've got in brackets there, US Space Force was established in 2020. A lot of people kind of thought that that was a Trump crazy idea. It wasn't. It had been debated for 10 years or more before Trump came into power, but it gained traction under um, former President Trump. Please remain former, personal opinion. Um, <laughs> Uh, so US Space Force, it is a separate force. So US now has Army, Air Force, Navy and Space Force. Um, that set something off, as you can imagine. China's um, military and civil space funding is pretty much in one, more or less in one agency or one, one division. Um, but no other country had really said, we are going to set up something that is a armed service focused on space. And so China and Russia saw that as very threatening and destabilizing. And we already were in a bit of escalation militarily in space, but that really um, gave us an upward, upward tick. And since then, a lot of countries, I wouldn't say followed suit because they have set up space commands or divisions within their armed services as joint commands, which is what ours is. 
So ours was uh, established in 2022. Um, and that was really, I think, a prudent move to think very carefully about what capabilities we need. How can those capabilities serve all the different armed force needs? So established in 2022, but we had already been part of what's called combined space operations uh, since 2005. So that's the five eyes countries, which is a intelligence arrangements we have between um, Canada, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and the US. Uh, and we do that very explicitly for space in CSPO. And recently that has expanded to include France and Germany. So we've been active in the military space space. <laughs> we now have our own space command and we have a defense space strategy. So it itself, a bit more strategic than the civil one, a bit more focused on lines of effort rather than just here's a bunch of capabilities we want to fund. But between the two of them, they don't line up in terms of timelines, they don't line up in terms of anything to do with what do we think is important for the nation in terms of capabilities. We don't have a national space policy. Um, this has become a bit politicised recently, but it's something that I will continue to advocate for. Japan, Canada, um, South Korea, the UK, these countries all have national space policies, and obviously the US has and has had for many years. Where, and I have written a piece where I argue we should have a national space policy and we could look to the UK and the Japan uh, models. Um, because those countries have really identified their middle powers like us. We don't need to model ourselves on the US. We don't have a budget or a geopolitical position like they do. Um, but those countries really, the UK and the Japan, have identified space capabilities, space technology and space politics as a part of who they are. Both of their strategies say, this is the first outline kind of identity politics priorities and then say this is how space fits into who we are as a nation and this is why we're going to do the following things to advance our interests and advance our position in our respective regions and i think that's a model that we need to follow because uh, we kind of have these two technology maps rather than a strategy really one of my key aims is to depoliticize what have um, you know, political decisions are always political decisions, but investment in space has become highly politicised in Australia. And I would have, last year I certainly said, I think we might be the only developed country in the world where space has become a partisan issue rather than a bipartisan issue. And that's a great shame. And that came out of a lot of finger pointing, some of which from the space industry itself, which was set up to believe the government was going to feed it money and grow an industry and then was told after the budget cuts last year, actually, no, we're not. Um, it's a change of government, different priorities. Um, but the problem, I think, is that because we don't have a national space policy, because we haven't identified why these space capabilities and technologies are so critical to so many of our national needs, it became a purely political decision. Uh, in particular, the cancellation of the National Space Mission for Earth Observation, which I will get to. Um, so, uh, uh, in fact, this is what I'm getting to now. Um, um, in 2000, so, so there was a commitment for us to have a National Space Mission for Earth Observation, three satellites, a small constellation of three satellites owned by Australia so that all the amazing things that we need Earth Observation for can be ours. Um, and so that we could contribute to the region. At least that's the opportunity. That is not the message that was given. Uh, it was cancelled uh, last year in, the, in the, uh, the, the current government's most recent budget. So a lot of people have said, oh, well, the, the problem was it was a liberal coalition government commitment the prior, the prior year, $1.2 billion. Clearly, the current government is going to see that as a liberal flagship and they don't want nothing to do with it. And so it got cancelled because of that. However, turns out the um, original plan for a National Earth Observation Space Infrastructure Plan, or the NEOS IP, was a Rudd government era commitment. So there was a request to GA and, and Bureau of Meteorology to prepare this plan. They looked at the economics, they detailed how we use all of this data. Again, GA, GA and Bureau of Meteorology are absolutely critical agencies in this. We use Earth, they, they create Earth observation data maps for government maps for identifying how to deal with, again, bushfires and floods uh, for geodetic purposes, for geology purposes, for helping to identify na native title and uh, cultural uh, heritage protection needs, mining, agriculture, and so on and so on. A Bureau of Meteorology provides a lot of very critical information around weather and something called space weather. When you have mass coronal injections from the sun or when we pass through certain areas of asteroid belts and the radiation increases, um, satellites are impacted. 
Um, and they need to know whether to turn off their instrumentation or change their inclination, or if something goes wrong, we need to know, was that a space weather event, or did someone just try and attack my satellite? You need to know what, what happened. Um, so Bureau of Meteorology, another very key agency in that respect. So they uh, were asked to put this report and plan together. <clears throat> in 2013, there was a plan and a budget put in place. In 2020, we had a bushfire earth observation task force. So again, CSIRO, GA, and Bureau of Meteorology, these are the, the, the suspects who keep returning. Um, uh, and then in 2022, the coalition government um, uh, committed $1.16 billion to um, the first phase of a national space mission for earth observation to design, build, and operate four satellites. Forgive me, I said three before. Uh, and so, yeah, nearly 1.2 billion. That's a significant chunk of an Australian budget. Uh, and last year, that whole plan was cancelled with an explicit justification of budget repair. Now, I have absolutely no doubt we needed to do budget repair, and I don't envy the current government's um, challenge in that respect, particularly in the face of everything else that's happening with rate hikes and housing crisis and everything that we know is happening. Uh, a lot of things were cut to pay for some submarines too. Um, but that turns out that's a national commitment. That's fine. You have to give some things up to do other things that the country deems important. Um, but but <laughs> we were left with big questions and it became highly, highly politicised. The industry started to say, this government doesn't care about the space industry. There was some literal finger pointing towards Minister Husek, who's obviously the Minister for Industry and Science, under whom the space agency falls. And so it became a bit of a personal fight. Uh, and he has continued to kind of shut things down in a politicised way. And I don't mean to say that as a finger pointing at him again, but this is the response in the face of politicising decisions about investment into uh, space capabilities. We've had some really horrific Senate estimates. We've had some horrific comments across the aisles. And we've had some god awful comments coming out of the space sector. It's been entirely detrimental to where we need to get as a nation. So as I said, my, a lot of my work is trying to depoliticize this and re-identify, okay, this decision's been made, fine, but let's look at what the risks are. So this is a NASA image of uh, the 2020 bushfires. So not only the hotspots of the fires, but also that's smoke, that's not cloud. So being able to track the impacts of that, of course, for our neighbors. Uh, I mentioned fishing before uh, and fisheries. So was an investment of $1.2 billion but Earth observation data, and there's a couple of different reports that identify this. Um, uh, McKinsey and Deloitte have brought out various different reports. Uh, a company called Symbios has done various different economic and risk assessments. Earth observation data brings 1.3 billion into our GDP for all of the ways in which we depend upon it. Our government spends $100 million per year on purchasing that data because as I said, most of our data comes from uh, Japan, European Space Agency, and the US, but increasingly it comes from commercial providers. Um, it, we have to pay for it. Uh, in fact, in 2012, when the Bali bombings took place, 11 different government departments purchased exactly the same image from one single company to get information for slightly different purposes. Part of that is because sometimes that information can't be shared between departments. There were IP contractual requirements from the commercial party, but that's a, you know, and it wasn't a significant amount of money, but it was a bit silly to buy the same image 11 times rather than be able to produce it ourselves as and when we need it. Uh, and, and on top of that, there's all sorts of infrastructure. So we get, so the, the narrative was we get this data for free or we can buy it. Well, yes, but let's figure out the cost of buying it versus the cost over time of having that infrastructure ourselves. Uh, and also, there are big data risks in buying that from commercial entities um, because we don't have any way of validating the data nor of knowing whether they have calibrated their instrumentation. And we also don't know whether the commercial company that, um, that took the images that provides the data is the same company that has processed and sold us the data. There might be more than one entity. We don't know if that has been interfered with. <laughs> um, GA has given an example once of a... Um, it wasn't Earth observation, it was an aerial image that they had uh, requested from a, from a company, I don't know what company that was, and they said, we need this bit of South Australian desert, we can't have clouds in the image, it's official government mapping, can't have a cloud. Sometimes that means you have to go over a few times, come back another day, costs a bit more money. 
The image they got had no clouds in it, but they have sufficient in-house expertise, as you might imagine at GA, to be able to identify the raw data and say, they've pretty much copy-pasted a bit of desert from over here to over here. There must have been a cloud in the way, and they tried to pass it off. Um, so there are data risks when you're buying from commercial companies that might be trying to undertake cost-saving measures. There are also data risks if we are, so the, the, the data that we don't have to pay for directly from our government partners, we pay for in other ways with our ground infrastructure. So I mentioned the sensors that uh, GA and CSIRO has, ground sensors, where we work with Indigenous communities to manage that. That's calibration. Um, in fact, I think I have an image to go with that. Those are calibration sensors. Now, this is nowhere near as exciting to look at as a rocket launch. <laughs> But what it's providing is critical to you and I every single day, to our national needs, to our community, to our economy, and to our military. Uh, and so we, we, don't, we don't have that guarantee when it's commercial. We, we provide that infrastructure in return for so-called free data from our government, uh, foreign government partners, but we've invested in that infrastructure. That has cost us money too, and continues to cost us money. So that has to be factored into the cost-saving benefit of do we do it ourselves? Do we get it in return from these partnerships? If the US, for example, might find itself in the face of a natural disaster or a, um, an adversarial situation, it's going to pri prioritize its own needs. And the 10% data uh, uh, timeshare arrangement we have with them over their um, Earth observation satellites, or the data that we might be requesting and, and when we have a bushfire, they might go, sorry, we're retasking it for our needs. It's our satellite. So there are data risks in terms of being able to access it, even with our friendly partners. And there are political risks. If the US was suddenly to say, actually, we're going to sell off what was government infrastructure and privatize it, we now have to deal with that company because we were depending on that government partnership. So those risks have to be passed through. There's actually a report coming out in a couple of weeks written by Symbios, uh, which I will be making much noise about when it comes out, which goes into a very deep risk analysis um, to demonstrate to our government what those data risks are and what the impact is on various sectors. So what was that $1.2 billion for? That's not what four satellites cost. You can buy four satellites from a commercial company, make it sovereign, and it costs you a few hundred thousand, uh, few, sorry, a few hundred million, <laughs> but certainly not $1.2 billion. We could, have, we could just do that, um, but we wanted to do something long-lasting and we wanted to do something a bit fancy. This was going to have onboard calibration instrumentation. So the satellites could calibrate to each other and calibrate other people's satellites on top of the ground sensor calibration. That's pretty super duper fancy stuff. No one else is really doing it yet. It's being looked at. But we were going to do something really great and be able to contribute calibration into the global Earth observation infrastructure and be a contributor into those global needs. We were going to become a bit more of a um, hefty player in that geopolitical and economic space space. Um, there was also data management. I mentioned GA manages the data for the Copernicus um, Earth Observation Program. A lot of data management uh, was built into that $1.2 billion. But calibration validation or CalVal and data management, again, doesn't sound so exciting, so wasn't part of the messaging, but nor was part of the messaging bushfires, floods, regional security. The messaging was satellites, spend money, that it kind of didn't come down to what we need. We need to think more about space as part of who we are. What are our critical needs? What can we afford as a nation? We don't have a budget like some other nations do, but we can decide what needs to be sovereign, built or bought, what can be purchased, either the infrastructure that then becomes our own or the data. What can we do in partnership? What might we want to build in partnership with Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, you know, share the budget, share the load, share the infrastructure. What might we want to do and what might that do for the region? And what can we contribute globally? We're really, really good at ground. Funnily enough, Australia is good at Earth. <laughs> we're good at ground, we're good at, you know, our geography is amazing for the ground sensor stuff and we're really, really good at data management. Again, not as exciting to talk about as rockets, but we're really good at it. Um, and our geography is very important for those things. So I assert that our key priorities for capability investment should be space situational awareness, which is looking up to track stuff in space. We have open skies, we have dark skies, we have often cloudless skies. So SSA, so space situational awareness, communications, 
satellite-based communications, and we do have a rather large budget in defence to build a three-satellite constellation for advanced communications. We also have what's called a, an optical ground station built at ANU and another one in Western Australia. Happy to speak more about that. Basically, that's laser communications, which are 10 times the speed of current satellite communications and pretty much unhackable. Um, and if you had a network of these ground stations around the region, which Australia supports to build, you have a regional secure communications infrastructure. And the other one, as you might glean from everything I've been saying, is Earth observation. Um, CalVal data management, that kind of thing. I, I did want to do a quick plug for a couple of things because I get to. So we, we have some really key capabilities at the ANU, Institute for Space. So that ground station I mentioned, we have some Earth observation missions. That particular instrumentation I mentioned about being tailored for eucalypt forests is coming out of ANU. Uh, and Mass Change is a NASA climate, um, uh, Earth observation climate data mission, which we, we support. The Australian Centre for Space Governance is a governance capability. It's a knowledge capability rather than a technical capability. And we are serving all of the things that I've been talking about today. And the other thing very quickly is um, a group of us across the country have been working quite hard to launch something which is coming out next week, a media launch called the Australian Space Diversity Alliance. This beautiful piece of artwork was donated by an Indigenous artist to the Alliance. Her name is Cathy Brown. Uh, and it has earth in the middle. It has multicolored uh, people sitting around the circle working together. It has constellations. I think it's absolutely stunning. Um, and that is really about, you know, technical workforce, STEM workforce is an issue across many sectors. Um, the only way we're going to solve this is through diversity. And it turns out diverse workforces are more innovative and um, competitive anyway. So that's what we're all about. I'm going to leave it there. I went over time. I do apologize, but I'm really quite happy to answer questions. No problem. Thank you, Cassandra. Just wait there. Yeah. Um, we've got a pretty good track record already, don't we, in the geography part of your diagram? Absolutely. We've been doing that stuff since Man on the Moon. Exactly right. Exactly right. The dish. Everyone knows the yeah. dish. Um, well, you know, that's our underdog story, isn't it? So the looking up piece, the communications piece, we do from the ground really well. And in fact, that ground station that I mentioned that ANU um, has built, it's there on Mount Stromlo. Um, it, there's a potential for that to do the 21st century version of this for the Artemis mission, the high definition version of you get to see that these people landing on the moon with 21st century technology. But despite that, you're telling us that our politicians <coughs> don't fully understand the technology and cost benefits of the stuff you're doing. I think that's right, and I don't expect them to become experts. I don't expect them even to listen to me and on for 50 minutes. But, um, but we, we'll send them a copy. Yeah, do yeah. do send them the 10 minute version. Um, but. But what needs to happen is the sector and the space agency need to do better messaging across government about, and so one of the projects that we keep promising to do, Alex, I'm going to hold us to doing that this year, is to write some ministerial or maybe secretarial briefs per portfolio that says your priorities, these, this is how space cap capabilities serve them. We're not trying to sell anything, we just want you to understand why these capabilities matter without saying mm. anything technical. Mm. Okay. We've got a good audience here and I think, uh, I was going to say, I have actually used a sextant. I actually yeah. found it, yes, I used to do a bit of uh, ocean racing in yachts and one after a race to Tasmania, coming back to Melbourne, we actually had a sextant on board and we worked out how to use the bloody thing. Fantastic. And found our position quite accurately, as, uh, as Dampier did, in fact, mapping the, just, never mind. Um, <laughs> I'm a geographer, I like maps. Yeah. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, Scott has a microphone, and if you'd let us know, Joe Bertolini, uh, oh, one here first. Thank you very much for the speech, uh, it was really good. Um, I just started a PhD in this topic, and um, I was wondering if you have any views on the gaps in public international law uh, with respect, if I, if I can ask, this is very close to my thesis, but, mm -hmm. um, to cyber attacks on satellites, and if that's a bit too specific, maybe just with respect to security generally, when we have um, the growing divide between the East and the West, which is happening right now, especially with China and Russia doing their own thing in space, and then the West and the European Space Agency on the other side. How, how is the international community going to regulate this coming into the future? Do you see a gap here, and how should we target this? Um, Thank you. 
Funnily enough, I might tackle the broader version of the question because cybersecurity, the answer is there's nothing in international law around cybersecurity, but the cybersecurity is up to the uh, engineers and operators to figure out how do you cyber harden because cyber threats are the biggest threats to space capabilities. Um, so how's it going internationally? I mean, it's no different for space than it is for anything else. So how do we think it's going generally? I'm wary of the West versus China, Russia. I mean, obviously there is there is a sense of that happening. You definitely see it in the multilateral fora through the UN. So I do a lot of work in space security, um, space arms control and responsible behaviors. And um, I took part in a couple of ways in a, a fairly recent initiative called the UN Open Ended Working Group on reducing space threats through norms, rules, and principles of responsible behaviors. They like their long titles. The point being, uh, very briefly, there's been an absolute deadlock on space arms control for decades. China and Russia have wanted a treaty for a long time, but they've wanted it to be about banning the placement of weapons in space. How do you define what's a weapon and what's not? How do you verify what's being launched as a weapon or not? And also, space-based weapons aren't really a thing. You might have heard about something about maybe Russia has a nuke in space. I wrote a piece in uh, Lowy's um, The Interpreter about that a couple of weeks ago where I detailed why, you know, yes, we should all be in mild panic about space security, but not about a nuclear weapon. It's the one thing that is prohibited in the Outer Space Treaty. The Soviets and the Americans have tested those in the 60s and 70s. And when you have an electromagnetic magnetic pulse in orbit, it impacts the entire orbit. Therefore, it impacts your own satellites. And if you are Russia today fighting a war in Ukraine, the last thing you're going to do is impact your own satellites. Um, so th there is that politicization happening in response to the, you know, the US on the other side was being very proactive in saying, don't want a treaty, don't want to talk about weapons in space, but also we're not going to provide any alternative and we will happily and gleefully and publicly block any attempt to come up with a treaty to prevent an arms race in outer space. So they were being a spoiler. Very, in the last couple of years, it has been the UK who's been the world's leading space diplomat. Australia has been partnering with the UK to say, Let's move away from the discussion of treaty or not. Let's move away from trying to define capabilities and weapons. Let's talk about responsible behaviors as non-binding but consensus-based decision. What's irresponsible? Well, using a missile to destroy a satellite in space and create debris, irresponsible. And we're now one of 38 countries that have committed never to test that. Would also be unlawful under the laws of armed conflict, by the way, because indiscriminate um, if you used it during war. Um, uh, and, and, but that, that's become politicized as well. So Russia very effectively blocked some of what was going to come out of that process. Um, but I did notice when I attended those meetings in the UN that China was sitting on the opposite side of the room from Russia. And that's not usually the case. And they were not aligning themselves with most of what Russia was saying, except for a few things about a treaty because of what's going on in Ukraine. So they are separating themselves slightly. They're doing their own space programs. They have their own space station at the moment and Taikonauts on board, they're doing great things. And every country has the right to do that under the Outer Space Treaty. Um, so it is politicized because of what, space is just another place where geopolitics are playing out. Um, how's it going? Not quite sure, <laughs> watch this space, but more than happy to speak to you at more length. I hate to be cynical, but the rules of war are being tested a little bit currently. The rules of war are always tested, but if you want to be an international lawyer, you have to be a bit of an optimist. Um, and most of the time, most parties in conflict stick to most of the rules because it is in their interest to do so and out of reciprocity. So, yeah. Just check your <coughs> external mic. So, did I get that right, that the, the showpiece was to spend $1.2 billion and have four satellites by... 2038. Yeah. Well, thank goodness the politicians killed it because, as we know, 2038 is a long time ago and all these, one, all these wonderful projects overrun, so it'd probably be, you know, it'd probably be 2045. It wouldn't cost 1.2, it would cost one point, um, it'd cost 3 billion. Um, and so, so, so we're going to live. So we would be living the next 20 years without these wonderful satellites. So that was the plan. Is that correct? Yeah, look, that's okay, correct. And you... it's all, we'll just park that. And, sure. so, so, and then you said <clears throat> we can buy our data for $100 million a year. Well, that, sound, that sounds really good value to me. Secondly, we could buy our own um, so we could buy a satellite for 100 million, 
So we should do that tomorrow mm. and start to walk before we run, mm. you know, and develop our capabilities mm. because Australia doesn't have a space capability. We have more, As than, you Australia might think. Is we have more a, than you might think. You know, so. you know that Australia, if you look up the Harvard Complexity Economy Review, and look, I, I'm not an expert in how they compile this, I can only say what this review says. Out of 133 countries, I'll ask the audience, what position is Australia? Does anybody know? 93. You know who our two partners on either side are? Pakistan and Uganda. So think about that. And then I'll just, just say one last thing. Australia, you know, the, a, sort of a gold standard for GDP, um, uh, R&D expenditure per GDP is 3%. Okay? Australia is one68 you know, we've got to get serious about this. Yep. You know, are we real? Look, and all the examples you gave, um, you know, to be frank, um, are things that we've been doing for 30 years, you know, satellites, ho-hum, you know. It's all about it, buying data and processing it. And, and also this so-called calibration technology that you mentioned, from my experience, being in the scientific sector is, as soon as you have, a, and you said, oh, this is going to be unique. My experience is, you wake up in the morning, you go to the office and you think you've got a brilliant idea, and as soon as you look at it, you find that 10 other people are thinking about it. So I don't think that we would actually have, be developing a new uh, idea. And yeah, that, so, uh, so if I may, yeah, Sandra if I may, so I, I agree with you 100%, let's walk before we run, and, and I think, that, that's part of what went wrong with, or well, I think it went wrong in the terms of when we went from we're going to have the amazing Rolls-Royce version to we actually, we're just going to walk. Um, so, or not even walk, we're, we're not going to have a car. Um, maybe we don't need the Rolls-Royce version off the bat, but, but in fact that 1.2 billion was in phases. There were three to four phases to that. It wasn't let's just build satellites and start from scratch. As I mentioned, it was to have onboard calibration validation, onboard CalVal. So that was, um, Australia's not just sitting in a box. They, we work very closely with the UK, European Space Agency, who, uh, who their timelines are 10 and 20 years. The point was Australia was set up and the US thought we were going to do this. They were depending on us doing this. And all of a sudden, and you might have read that in the news as well, they were told the day before the, the public announcement that it was cancelled and they went, well, what? <laughs> Hang on a second. We need you guys to be doing this. So it wasn't just us sitting on our own and thinking about this idea on our own. But I agree with you. How could we revisit that decision in steps? What could we do first? We're already doing the data really well. What could we do about the, um, the data management in the next phase? What could we do about advancing our calibration, validation capabilities in the next stage? Let's work towards, do we think about just buying the cheaper version of the satellites, even though you can't really update those to have the onboard CalVal stuff, but there might be different ways to think about our EO needs, what, what do we need, what can we buy versus what do we need to invest in over time than just buy every day because of the data and cost risks with that? Um, and, and, you know, and what can we do with partners? We just need to revisit, here was the super duper version of the plan. Well, what, what are the steps to take to get towards securing our needs? Let's, I know Mike's got some questions from our online audience. Yes, thanks, Rob, and thank you, Cassandra. At, um, I've got uh, from uh, one of our own, Catriona Nguyen Robinson. Uh, she says it's a great thought-provoking presentation. Thank you. Uh, she is concerned with um, how busy it's getting up there. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, there's uh, over 25,000 objects bigger than a tennis ball in orbit uh, with the satellites we send into orbit plus all of the debris. How much consideration is giving to the design of what countries send out into space? Uh, so in terms of size, how much space traffic there already is, how bright they'll be in the sky as newer satellites can be as bright as the brightest stars in the sky and therefore interfering with astronomy and dark skies and all of that sort of good things um, and other factors. So she apologises for a long question. But, uh, great, great, great question. I just pulled up random NASA orbital debris. I mean, there's many different versions of this image, but um, these dots are clearly not to scale, but they represent actual catalogued objects. So she's right about the tennis ball objects. So the problem is today there's about 11,500 
operational satellites. In two weeks' time, that's going to be more. In two weeks' time, that's going to be more. In two weeks' time, that's going to be more. SpaceX is launching 20 to 40 of its own satellites every week or two, and every time it launches, it has other client satellites on board as well. So these mega constellations is causing us an enormous issue. It, you know, 10 years ago, we had two thousand satellites. Now we have 11 and a half thousand and that number's changing every week. On top of those operational satellites, there is an estimated, but we never quite know, 130 million pieces of debris in orbit. That's everything from a defunct double-decker sized 1980s satellite that's kind of hanging out in what's called a graveyard orbit down to fragmentation debris either from various anti-satellite tests from China, uh, the US, India and Russia or just from accidents, things hitting each other and breaking up into debris. The problem is most of that traffic, as you'll notice, is very close to the Earth. That's the low Earth orbits, anything from 160 to 1,600 kilometres. We drive further than that to go to the beach. Um, well, at least we do from Canberra, I guess. The beach is closer here. But I mean, when you go on holiday, um, space is not that far, and most of that traffic is really, really close, around the 500 kilometre mark. Um, and Canberra. Yeah, that's right. There we go. You, I don't know how often you go to Canberra, but it's not that far. Um, it's orbiting at seven kilometres per second or ten times the speed of a bullet. Don't ask me what kind of bullet, your regular kind of bullet. <laughs> so if you have two objects at that velocity hitting each other, uh, did someone do the calculations, right? It is massive. So something the size of a pea can do lethal damage to a satellite. So managing the traffic, the active traffic, plus the debris is becoming an enormous issue. So that you kind of think of that as, as safety of operations, an enormous issue in terms of environmental sustainability and sustainability of the environment that we've promised under the Outer Space Treaty intergenerational access to these, to these benefits. And we were threatening that. And security, because if we lose access to these critical capabilities, that has security implications. There's a lot of people thinking very hard about how to resolve it. We don't have an international law framework. We have various governance frameworks. We do have domestic law requirements. Before you get a license, you have to prove you have an orbital debris mitigation plan. What are you going to do with your satellite when it, when it comes to the end of life? Um, but it is something that keeps me up at night. So, it, so a bit the size of a pea can knock out a GPS satellite? Probably not GPS because they're sitting further out at, at what's okay. called MEO, so 20,000 kilometres from Earth where there's far less traffic and the velocity is, is so less slower. less risk, but possible. Um, but but um, ironically, Russia tested an anti-satellite weapon in 2021 and a piece of debris f that's tracked from that, uh, that breakup uh, threatened the International Space Station and all astronauts, including the Russian cosmonauts, had to shelter, shelter in place. Right. <clears throat> That's, that's comforting. Hi, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I'm actually studying Masters of Biotech and I'm looking into uh, researching on space biology and I was trying to identify the government interest in this specific subject. So would you be able to tell me a little bit about the, what's the was the situation in policies and what's the national interest in this? So first of all, you are way smarter than me, there is no doubt. Um, there is none. And you mentioned before the, the problem of uh, government investment in R&D, and that's not a current government, that is Australian government over decades. We just don't invest in R&D, and R&D and R &D doesn't necessarily mean a chip or a gadget or a widget, it means the kind of work you're doing as well. Um, and also, for decades, we haven't had very meaningful investment into universities themselves. So it's a challenge, but this is exactly what the ANU Institute for Space is set up to do. And, and various other universities have uh, space institutes. I mean, what's different about ANU is that we are truly multidisciplinary. Uh, Most of the other space institutes are engineering focused, but, it, but we all work together as well because it's not about competing with each other. It's about how do we get there as a nation so, I mean, the, you know, we see it as, the, we talk about the, um, the other benefits. So uh, space, food and biology at ANU, for example, Kate, Caitlin Burt, who does that, she's um, helped grow food on the International Space Station and they've used um, waste products, human waste products from the astronauts, urine and that kind of thing, being able to filter out byproducts from that. There is some that's still waste, but there is useful byproduct out of that that can be used to grow food. Well, you can use that also for drought resistant crops uh, and climate resistance. So being able to translate what you do for terrestrial needs is the way to get investment. I'm just going to limit this to about three or four questions. Cassandra's done a great job and we, want to, we don't want to exhaust her completely. She's a guest. Uh, one here. 
Hey, thank you very much. So I just wanted to pick your brain about something you mentioned, the creation of the Space Force by the Americans and how that was destabilizing. Uh, Two-part question here. Did this give the Americans any capabilities that they didn't already have? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what could we expect from the Russians or Chinese in response to this? Uh, it's a great question about capability. In fact, that's, that's how it got traction, that's how it got budget, is because internally they were able to make the case, their case was China and Russia are threatening us in space, we need to have more capabilities, counter space capabilities, the ability to do things in space. So there's... You know, they're not space weapons, but if you have a capability to manoeuvre a satellite within an orbit, which is very complex, and come up close to another satellite and interfere with it or listen in on it, or that is a counter space capability. Russia and China were way out ahead of the US, so they said, we need more capabilities, give us a space force, give us a budget. But in doing so, they are the only country in the world who have said space is a war fighting domain. NATO countries have debated it explicitly and said, no, no, we're calling it an operational domain. The Outer Space Treaty says you can't use space to fight a war. Clearly, we use it to support war. But So, so the way they did it was destabilising. Clearly, Russia and China then went, the US is threatening us in space. We need to ramp up our spending. But they were already on that track. So we did see a bit of an escalatory moment. I am grateful that the process, that responsible behaviours agenda that I mentioned, the role that the UK has taken as a space diplomat, the way that Japan and South Korea and Canada uh, and, and other countries are really using space as a, as a diplomatic lever for other issues, but thereby shoring up, you know, we all have a vested interest in space remaining stable. More and more uh, companies are becoming active in this in this. I keep saying space, in, in the kind of responsible behaviours agenda as well, they're signed onto statements because their business model depends on space remaining stable. So we are seeing a pushback. The US itself has completely changed its rhetoric in the last couple of years. It's now almost leading the way from within Space Force on they have their five tenets of responsible behaviour. They now talk about responsible behaviour. They have taken out language about... Um, superiority and dominance in space. They've changed the way they're talking about what they do. Um, but as I said before, space is just another domain in which geopolitics are playing out. Another one? <clears throat> you, you mentioned um, some of the new constellation of Australian startups in space and convinced us that it's uh, important for governments to invest. Do you think it's possible to convince big corporates in Australia to invest, the mm. ASX 200? <clears throat> That's a great question. And, and it, look, you know, it's not all about startups. You can't do everything through startups. And that's what I meant by having done it, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit backwards by saying, put money into an industry instead of decide what big, exquisite, and amazing things you need and get industry to help you build it. That's what Defence has done for these very expensive communication satellites. Lockheed Martin is building it for Defence and then it becomes Defence propriety. Lockheed Martin will train Defence how to use it and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not just about startups, and in fact, startups are not going to get us there, but startups are amazing. There's one really great one called Skycraft, which is using satellites for air traffic management. Oh, that's amazing. So, um, you know, assist in this GPS problem, you can do air traffic management from satellites. So, yes, startups are great, but that wasn't your question. Um, yes, we need more venture capital investment. We need to think more, and that's why it's so amazing that Rebecca Lishinsky at RMIT is thinking about the property sector. They are enormous users of Earth observation data. What kind of property sector investment could we get into this? Bit of money in that sector. What about the mining sector, which is also very, very dependent on PNT and Earth observation? Bit of money in that sector. Maybe we should be talking to <clears throat> the companies that are driving our primary industries and our primary financial sectors about the, their vested interest as users and how they could be supporting it as well. Have a, have a sip. Thank and you. Think is there one more question, Scott? No? This will be, this will be our last <coughs> one. Um, first of all, thanks for mentioning that Diagrams not to scale because too often it's put up. <laughs> um, the there is of course a there's sort of like putting up sat sovereign satellites or there's buying data, but there's a continuum of options between those two. Um, and I sort of sometimes got the feeling in some of the discussions in some of the document plans you described that. Say options about exploring putting sensors 
that are important to us, but maybe not quite leading importance to other nations, put it, collaborating with existing the JAXA or NASA or UMETSAT or whatever, putting it up on satellite, putting sensors on satellites is another avenue that doesn't seem to be very popular. And I'm just wondering, or not talked about much, I'm just wondering whether that's a reason for that. So you mean the calibration sensors? No, no, actually, the, but, well, like the Brazilians worked putting up a sensor on some of the US weather satellites. Yeah. Um, we, so we're already doing some of that, and as I mentioned, when we thought that this particular ANU capability that's called OzFuel, this um, eucalypt forest um, uh, bushfire mitigation sensor, um, was supposed to be on the National Space Mission for Earth Observation, so we're now looking for other vehicles, including, we, we, you know, we, as in ANU, we as in Australia, already partner a lot with NASA and the European Space Agency on that kind of technology development um, in very niche little areas. We're good at little bits of it, and, and that's how we should, you know... Canada does this brilliantly, by the way. They've decided middle, middle power, not as huge a budget as, as our neighbours, want to be on the International Space Station, we'll build a robotic arm, the Canada arm. It's one thing they do really well. The budget is sufficient for them. It buys them a ticket for an astronaut on the International Space Station. It has them at the table in geopolitical decision-making. They've done a really smart middle power space decision there. Uh, and I think we could think about sensors in the same way. So it is happening. It's not talked about much because we keep hearing about rockets and astronauts, um, which, I, you know, again, I'm a fan. It's great. I'm just, we need to talk about all the other bits and pieces. Um, but the timelines are important too. You can't put a sensor on a satellite that's already flying. Can't be done, at least not yet. Um, so you need to be building it into the design of a satellite, and if that is a, an exquisite government satellite and not a small sat that SpaceX is throwing together on a, on a um, conveyor belt, there, there's many, many years in that design, and then qualifica qualification testing, is it going to survive radiation, is it going to survive launch, is it, how's it going to operate, onboard computing, how are you going to update, so, like that, that takes many years, that's why the timeline for the National Space Mission was 10 years, you can't do this in two years. It's another issue with our kind of four-year political cycles. You, you, we need 10-year plans for this. Um, so it is happening. It, maybe we just need to talk about it more, but those timelines are, are part of the issue. Cassandra, take a break. You've done a great job. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. I'm gonna... I'm now going to pass to uh, Mike Flatley, our CEO of Royal Society of Victoria, to offer a vote of thanks. He doesn't that's right, yes. And, and, you, yes, and Mike, dance. you can wrap the evening up too. Yep, no problem. Um, Cassandra, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Over the last nine years, I'd say, we've been hearing so many lectures from environmental scientists in particular who've been using things that I, I hadn't heard of before I came to work here. Uh, Landsat, Himawari, nine, seven? Yep. Uh, nine hours, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yep. right. Um, and <clears throat> it struck me how often they discussed, just in passing as they were talking about the results of their research, um, how, how much like with the Australian synchrotron, they were looking for time on the satellite. They were looking for something specific. And the extent to which our, our scientists, our research scientists, mm. are reliant on other countries. Um, and, and of course, we're reliant on other countries throughout the research endeavour, we know that. The, all of our research um, our networks are global and international. But in terms of Australian scientists being able to analyse Australian land, mm. the earth observation in particular around uh, managing for bushfire and catastrophic bushfire, which we know is very important here. Um, it seemed to me at the time we're really, really vulnerable and really, really reliant on other countries to help us manage our country. So when I saw a lot of the work that you were doing, and in particular a lot of the posting and the opinions, yes, you were sharing with us online uh, via LinkedIn, I was very excited to finally find somebody who'd been looking at the whole system, not just the research infrastructure and the reliance that we have from the research community on this, but the whole geopolitical piece and what that does to influence what we invest in as a country. Mm. Um, so I would like to, on behalf of all of us, to thank you for sharing your scholarship and your insights with us today, and I, um, I hope we get some, uh, some more progress in the very near future. So please thank join me so in welcoming Cassandra.